Hello everyone, uh, last video of the week is going to be looking at three different things. Um, the last video we were looking at how we measure inequality, whether it be through income or wealth by Lorentz curves and Gini coefficients. What we're going to be looking at in this one then, the three things are one, causes of inequality. Uh, we have looked at this before um, in relative poverty video, but it's worth thinking about them again, some of them in a little bit more detail. We're going to be looking at a new diagram which we call the Kuznets curve. And then finally we're going to be looking at the importance of inequality for capitalism to function properly. Right, anyway, first things first then, causes of inequality. Um, we're looking here then at what are the reasons why we have gaps in income and wealth between different people across society. Labour markets is a really, really obvious cause. Um, some people earn high wages, some people earn low wages. Uh, that can be driven by things like the gig economy, underemployment, zero hour contracts. And those things can lead to a growth of the number of people forced to accept low paid and often very insecure work. And obviously if you're living in low wage work or very insecure work, you're not able to save and you're not able to build a wealth and that would drive up wealth inequality as well. Um, immobility, we've already mentioned this one before, is a really, really important cause of inequality. We have occupational and geographical immobility of labour. So occupations where people lack skills to accept jobs. Well, that makes it more difficult to accept well-paid work and again can lead to more inequality and poverty. But also we have geographical, where we have people... Um, stuck in areas of high unemployment that are unable to relocate where jobs might be available due to high house prices, high relocation costs, high transport costs and that can mean that we have pockets of deprivation stuck around the economy. Um, Globalisation also ties in with this. Uh, this is about the growth in international trade. Uh, as we become more open to international trade as a country we're now in a situation where lots of our big industries have been in decline. So these could be things like steel production, ship production, big manufacturing industries. Those industries have often relocated to countries like China and India uh, due to low wage rates. While the people in Britain that have been left behind have become structurally unemployed, often stuck in pockets of deprivation, which would lead to more inequality. Uh, human capital is a key cause of inequality. Uh, people with good skills will generally work in more productive jobs and therefore earn more money than people that don't have those skills. Uh, discrimination, um, I'm ashamed to say that this still happens in Britain and even more so in other countries across the world where people from certain ethnic backgrounds, people who are women, even people with particular accents will often be uh, discriminated against when it comes to particular jobs. And that will often force people from certain backgrounds to have to accept lower paid work. Uh, one thing that can limit or reduce inequality is minimum wages. So minimum wages should hopefully help people who work escape at least absolute poverty. But then minimum wages can also be a cause of inequality. We've got different minimum wage rates for certain age groups. And that can lead to 18-year-olds um, being paid less than 21-year-olds, etc., due to different minimum wage rates. Um, the industry that you work in will also potentially be a cause of inequality. If you've got good skills, but you're employed in, a, in an industry which is struggling financially, it's very unlikely you'll get the wage growth that somebody would do that work in a more successful industry. So you tend to find that different wage rates exist between different industries. It's also worth noting on that one as well, the difference between private sector and public sector work. So in recent years, uh, wage growth of teachers and nurses has not been as high as it would be normally due to high government debt. Well, that lack of wage growth for public sector workers has often created a, a gap between what private sector people get paid and what public sector workers might get paid. Wealth is a major source of inequality. 
people that are born into wealthy backgrounds in good neighbourhoods, in good areas, with good access to schools and hospitals and job opportunities, will generally have increased abilities to receive better paid jobs in the future. It's also worth remembering that wealth will generate incomes, so property will generate rents, shares generate dividends, etc., and that would lead to more inequality. Um, inactivity is obviously a major cause of uh, inequality. Um, if people are unable to work due to disabilities or old age, then again, it prevents them from earning higher incomes. You've got trade union power. So a trade union um, is designed to protect the interests of workers. So lots of professions have different trade unions. So teaching has something like the NUT, which is a big trade union. But then we have big trade unions like Unison that will protect the interests of workers um, in particular industries. People have to pay to be in a trade union. But once you're in that trade union, what they will do, they will negotiate on your behalf to receive better wages and better terms and conditions. So you tend to find that industries with strong trade unions will be able to force up wage rates more for its members than in jobs where trade union power is very, very limited. Uh, the last one I want to mention here is government intervention. So governments can do a lot to reduce inequality. They can use what we call progressive taxes. So income tax, for example, is a progressive tax where the more you earn, the higher percent tax that you will pay. Well, when you have high progressive taxes, it should in theory reduce the gap between top and low income people by taking more money off richer people. Uh, we also look at redistribution. If governments offer good or high levels of financial support for low-income people, so disability allowances, old age pensions, um, tax credit allowances, family allowances, these things should in theory reduce that gap between rich and poor people. Governments though can also provide more opportunities for people, better access to education and housing, to give people better chances of upgrading their human capital to get well-paid jobs when they're older. Um, so, guys, you've got there, not an extensive list, but some really, really important causes of inequality. Now, at the bottom here, we've then got something we call the cus next curve. Now, what this diagram does, it shows the relationship between how incomes and inequality changes over time. Now, what it's imagined on the bottom axis we're going from a situation of very low incomes to very high incomes. But what we're looking at here is a situation where we're looking at the average income. This could be the GDP per capita. So we're going from a low GDP per capita to a high GDP per capita. So from a developing to a developed economy. Now um, you've then got inequality. So you would have down here low inequality and then high inequality. Now, when economies first start off growing and developing, we start off from a situation at the Red Cross where everyone is poor. So because the economy is very undeveloped and there aren't that many jobs or businesses, uh, most people are living as things like subsistence farmers and really, really struggling. It means that everyone is poor. What it also means, though, is in theory, inequality is also low. If everyone's poor, that's really, really low inequality. But then as economies grow and incomes start to increase, what you might find is that poverty starts to fall. So as incomes start to grow, absolute poverty will start to fall. But what you will get is a growth in inequality. So as businesses start to grow and become more successful, you will have winners and losers. Entrepreneurs, for example, will start to generate high profits. Uh, they'll start to generate higher incomes and pay other rich people higher dividends. There will be a bit of a trickle-down effect where poorer people will get job opportunities, but you've got that big explosion in growth between rich and poor people. 
what often happens, the lack of government intervention will mean that poorer people will get exploited by businesses and not receive a fair wage for what they do. There won't be a tax system in place to redistribute to poorer people. So as economies originally grow and develop, you tend to find that inequality will start to increase. Uh, this happened in Britain in the 19th century. So we had a big explosion in economic growth. Average incomes were increasing, but these incomes were going mainly to the rich. So the wealthy factory owners were building up huge profits and um, huge levels of wealth, and they weren't sharing that with their workers. So high growth, growth and average incomes, but inequality started to increase. But then what the Kuznets curve then suggests is what will happen is there'll be a turning point where the workers will say, you know what, we've had enough of this. We are sick of being exploited by these rich, wealthy people and governments will start to intervene more. So as economic growth keeps on increasing now, there'll be more government intervention taking place. So governments will start to introduce more progressive taxes they'll start to redistribute more money to poorer people. They'll start to impose minimum wage rates and um, expectations that businesses need to follow. Uh, we'll start to see more provision of housing and education and healthcare to people, which will hopefully mean that after this turning point, inequality starts to fall as incomes carry on growing. So for Britain, World War II was a turning point. So after World War II, um, we had high levels of inequality in Britain. And then what happened was we had a government that came in offering people a national health service. We had a big increase in the access to education and opportunities. We've started to have more progressive taxes creep into society. And that has led to inequality generally falling in Britain since World War II. Um, last thing is this. You've got here capitalism and inequality. Now remember capitalism is free market economics. So a free market would be where um, we allow households and firms to interact to decide on price levels, resource allocation, free from government control. Now free markets then, they need motivators to be successful. So free markets are often deemed to be really, really efficient because they encourage lots and lots of hard work. So the logic would be in a free market economy, firms want to be able to make more and more profits to build up incomes and wealth. So that pursuit of high profit will mean that firms will be competing fiercely against each other to get people to buy their goods and services. They'll be frantically trying to reduce costs and prices in order to get people to buy more from them. Well, that's good, that's encouraging economic growth and people to create businesses. But also, we all work hard in a free market economy to get better jobs. We all want to become more productive, more higher skilled, so we can earn higher wages. So what these motivators do, you know, people trying to get more profits and higher wages, then it's rewarding hard work. Now, because we can access these rewards in a free market or capitalist society, it should encourage high rates of economic growth. We also have a trickle-down effect, uh, where when people pursue and receive higher incomes, some of those incomes will trickle down and benefit lower-income people as well. So, free market economics often is based on the idea that we need inequality. Those that work hard, those that work efficiently and become more productive will be the ones that get these rewards for their hard work and effort. And because of that, it's encouraging lots and lots of economic growth. Now, a good word to think about here is the word equitable. All equitable means is fair. So, in many ways, and I would agree with this, inequality is absolutely fair. Because those that work the hardest and set up businesses and take big risks and become more productive over time should get a bigger access to the incomes and the wealth of the economy. And that is what free market economics is all about. But there is a big problem of this. Um, if inequality is too high because of capitalism and free market economics, it will mean your poorest people in your economy cannot access basic essentials. 
So that would mean that children born into poverty will not be able to access what they need to fulfil their potential. So in a free market economy, if you want it, you've got to pay for it. You've got to work hard and get it yourself. Well, that would mean in a pure free market economy, poorer people would not be able to access education, healthcare, housing, and that would pre- pre- prevent them from reaching their potential. And if people don't achieve their potential, it will hold back economic growth. And think about why. If you've got a big pool of low skill workers, those workers are very unproductive. So it's a bit of value judgment, this really. Free market economics requires inequality. And that inequality will drive people to work hard and better themselves. But the problem is, if we've got too big a gap between rich and poor people, it will mean that poorer people will struggle to get what they need to survive. Well, that's more absolute and relative poverty. And if these people can't get the skills they need to fulfil their potential, it will hold back economic growth in the economy. So we've, we've got to get this right. We've got to have these free market incentives to create businesses, earn profits, earn more money. But we've also got to have governments that ensure that people on low incomes have the opportunities to fulfil their potential. So this could be more progressive taxes, uh, more redistribution of income from high earners to low earners. The problem is if you do too much of this, you can take away these incentives to work hard. And this really is, is the reason why we have mixed economies. We want the free market to encourage hard work and efficiency. That will create inequality, but that inequality should drive people to better themselves. But the problem is it can create too big a gap between rich and poor people. But if we have too much intervention and we have too low inequality, then the problem is there's no incentive to work. So, for example, if businesses and workers have to pay too high a tax to prevent inequality, where's the incentive to better yourself? So, really, getting inequality at an acceptable level is probably more of a realistic target than eliminating inequality. If we go back to the Lorenz curve, nobody would say we should be on the line of full equality. We need a degree of inequality, but it's getting inequality at what we deem to be a acceptable level to ensure that we can fulfil our potential as an economy. All right, guys, thank you very much. I will stop there.